grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. The altar this morning is covered in white pyramids. A depiction of an angel is on the front of your bulletin. Our hymns, our prayers, our readings, they speak of angels and demons and war. Why? Because it is the feast of St. Michael and all angels. Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. It's interesting, again, as I was reading or singing the, uh, or looking through the hymns for this week, it's amazing how the sermon really is just an exposition of everything that we just got through singing about regarding the angels. I love it when the, uh, days like this come on our church calendar where we get to focus on one thing and everything just kind of bleeds into each other. You know, there's a lot that we know and there's a lot that we don't know about this very distinct order of spiritual beings who inhabit the hidden world around us. For example, we don't know when angels were created, but at some point in the process of creation, most likely day one, God made angels who must have been created simultaneously with no need to be fruitful and multiply like human beings. How and when they were created, we don't know the details. Second, we don't know how many angels actually exist. The word that's often used to describe their number is the word myriads. This is the largest number that the ancients would use. Nor do we know what substance angelic beings consist. Our souls obviously housed in physical bodies with flesh and blood. Angels, though, have no bodies, allowing them to operate differently. Although they may be seen at times in bodies, doing what bodies do, like eating, and even though at times they appear as men. What we do know is this, is that angels are not soft. They are not effeminate beings, nor do all angels have wings. Now, ladies, I am going to address you. When you are looking to decorate for Christmas, stop buying effeminate-looking angels. You don't have to throw away what you got, okay? I'm not going to be so bold as to say that. Keep what you've got, but don't buy any more. We are buying angel figurines made in China from Hobby Lobby. The angels I've seen as of late, long blonde flowing hair, red fingernails. Holy moly, the end is clearly near. These beings, beloved, are not effeminate at all. They are fearful. I mean, when an angel interacts with a human being, what is the first words that come out of their mouth? Do not be afraid. Why? Because the person that they are with is shaking in his boots. Do not be afraid. Why? Because angels are awesome in the truest sense of the word. Angels are powerful spirits having both intellect and will excelling in strength, created to serve God by ministering to mankind, but they are not all-seeing, all-knowing, and all-powerful as God is. Moreover, from what we can tell, the angels do this within a hierarchy of sorts. The first angel that we read of, he guards Adam and Eve from eating the tree of life. This was an act of mercy on God's part. Because if Adam and Eve were to eat of that tree of life, they would have lived forever in their fallen estate. The Bible calls this angel a cherubim. Cherubim. A fearsome warrior, a protector of sorts. And this is why Luther rightly teaches us in the morning and evening prayer that God would let your holy angel be with me that the evil foe may have no power over me. What a wonderful request. The angels are employed to promote the work of the church and protect its servants. 
Other angels, though, within this hierarchy are called seraphim, the burning ones. They're the ones who cover their eyes, who cover their feet, and fly around the throne of God singing, holy, holy, holy. They say, holy, holy, holy. It's like, it's like a, a, a liturgy. One says it, one says it, one says it. Holy, holy, holy. Lord God of Sabaoth. That was just in the stanza that we just sang. Heaven and earth are full of thy glory. The seraphim stand in the undiminished glory of heaven, concerned primarily with the holiness of God. Angels not only guard and protect, but they are worshipers, much of which is echoed in our liturgy. Other angels, though, are known for preaching. They're known for delivering messages to the Lord's people. And my point is, is that crit at critical moments in God's dealing with mankind, you find angels who are delivering a message or explaining the moment to the persons who just got through witnessing it. There are a few angels in the Bible who are named Gabriel, you know that name. Gabriel means the hero of God. Now in the Old Testament uh, apocryphal book by the name of Tobit, you have an angel who is named Raphael, one of the main characters of that book. And then of course you have Michael, whose name means one like God. Michael is called a chief angel, or what we would say an archangel, superior to all the others. And this is why this day in the church year bears his name. But even then, Michael is second in command to our Lord Jesus. We sing in the Sanctus, Holy, 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 Lord God of Sabaoth. Not Sabbath. Sabaoth. Sabaoth means Lord of the armies. Angelic armies. So Michael serves the Lord both day and night, defending his church from the evil one and from his minions. All angels were created holy and righteous and good, just like God. But sometime after their creation, St. Jude tells us that some did not keep their proper domain, but rather left their own abode, led by Lucifer, which is the Latin name, but there's several others, who was originally a holy angel, a certain number defected. There was a rebellion in heaven. And these angelic, or these angels rather, became sinful in their nature and in their work. And as a result, they were condemned, never to return to communion with God, and everlasting fire was kindled just for them. These fallen angels, though, are divided into two categories. Two classes. There are those who are free and there are those who are bound, reserved in everlasting chains under darkness for the judgment of the great day. You think about the pigs when Jesus cast the demons out or into the out of the man into the pigs. What do the demons say? Are you gonna cat are you gonna bind us? Are you gonna cast us where the others are? Now, beloved, I'm not the brightest candle on the candelabra, but it's those demons that are not bound, <laughs> those demons that are free, those are the ones that I'm concerned about the most. They are the ones that the New Testament constantly reference and are the greatest danger that we face outside of the fallen world that we live in, our own sinful flesh. Those demons are cunning. And deceitful, they even quote scripture. They are liars and murderers. They're utterly depraved. They're perverted. They're wicked and they're unclean until the day of and until the day of judgment. God permits them to roam the earth. You think about this regarding the state. They are the driving force behind the wickedness of the world, seeking to snuff out the light of the gospel, holding the heathen in abject idolatry and superstition. These evil angels are partially to blame for the wickedness that invades the home as pornography and sexual sins and drugs and drunkenness take hold of the masses more and more and more. Some people are so foolish to actually invite these demons into their homes and lives by practicing witchcraft, 
and other dark arts. Moreover, these devils plot to disturb and destroy the church by scattering heresies, hindering the work of faithful pastors, sowing discord and strife, tempting, tempting believers to turn away from the truth and against one another. The truth is we are surrounded by these evil creatures who seek to separate us from Christ and His church. Their constant goal is to bring violence, perversion, and confusion, and ultimately, ultimately, to gobble us up, just like a snake with an egg. Against them, we don't stand a chance. Now look, I get it. We are so limited by the here and the now, by what we see, what we desire, what we crave, that we can't begin to comprehend the reality that exists in this unseen world populated by angels. Ears don't hear them. Eyes rarely see them. Angels can only be believed and received by faith. But this is how God works, isn't it? When you start to line up the ways in which God works, He always hides Himself. He hides Himself under weak and unimpressive things. For instance, God hides the majestic warfare of His holy angels under invisibility and silence. He hides His assault on the devil's kingdom under just a little bit of water and word and wine an unleavened bread. And this is why so many people don't believe. Because to the eyes and the ears of men, it all seems like foolishness. Sure, we may, may desire to look into angels, but angels, they actually desire to look into the gospel of Christ and Him crucified for you. For you see, it wasn't for the angels that Jesus left the right hand of God the Father Almighty and came into the visible realm clothed with flesh and blood. Not for them. Uh-uh. It wasn't for the angels that Jesus went to the cross with his physical body and was crucified, died, and was buried on the third day and rose. And it's not for the angels that Jesus gives you his body and his blood to eat and to drink. Beloved, that's all for you. For you. Why? Because in our epistle text, we learn that there is this battle between the angels and the demons and St. Michael, the great archangel who removes Satan from the heavenly council, doing so with the only weapons that can destroy the devil, that being the word of God and the blood of Jesus. What the angels have conquered the devil with is exactly what we concern ourselves here this morning. When you think about that text that we read just a few moments ago in the Gospel lesson where the disciples came back after being sent out uh, to proclaim the good news of the Gospel, that they came back and they said, even the evil spirits are subject to us in your name. And Jesus says what? He says, I saw Satan fall like lightning. Now, in my background, People would take that one verse and they take this, they take a, the preacher usually has like a pry bar up here and he takes this pry bar and he pries out that one verse and he throws it way at the beginning of creation. That somehow in the order of creation that's when the devil fell and a third of the angels and we take a verse out of Revelation and all that kind of stuff and we come up with this end time schema. Jesus is saying when those disciples were out ministering, when they were proclaiming, that's when like Satan had absolutely no standing anywhere he went. He couldn't go anywhere. He was falling like lightning from heaven. Not something that happened way, 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 way long time ago. He was like, no, I saw you. He, 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 he fell. This is the authority the Word of God has and that the blood of Jesus has. And those same weapons against this, angel, this uh, undesirable angelic force are the same ones that are being offered to you here this very morning. The blood of the Lamb and the word of their testimony. The same tools that St. Michael the Archangel used to boot the devil out of the counsel of God, Jesus delivers to you today. In His word, and His body, and His blood. And though our eyes cannot see, our ears hear, let us believe. 
For the day is coming when faith will come to an end, when our eyes will see and our ears will hear. And we will hear angels and archangels and all the company of heaven singing blessing, honor, glory, power be to him who sits on the throne and unto the Lamb forever and ever. Amen. And now may the peace of God which passes all understanding guard your hearts and your minds through Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen.